from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. These extremely rare but damaged motion pictures of Mark Twain were taken at his home in Connecticut in 1909, a year before his death. A copy of the film, along with first editions and thousands of the celebrated writer's letters and manuscripts, are part of the Mark Twain Project. Its aim is to painstakingly edit and publish the bulk of Twain's huge output. Twain's daughter bequeathed her father's papers to the University of California at Berkeley in 1962. The extensive collection is hidden away in small offices on the top floor of Bancroft Library. For three decades, eight editors have been poring over more than 10,000 letters, plus notebooks, story and book manuscripts, and newspaper clippings, seeking to find the real Mark Twain and to make all of his work accurate and accessible. This is your literary heritage here in our files. It has to be edited, it has to be preserved in some form that is going to be transmittable to the future. Robert Hurst, the general editor, has devoted his entire professional life since 1967 to Twain, whom he sees as a towering talent in language and humor. I still hear my editors laughing out loud down the hall because they're reading something which they've probably read a dozen times before, but it's still alive, it's still funny, no matter how many times you read it. Many academics would argue that Twain is still America's best loved, perhaps its best writer. Professor Frederick Cruz recently retired from Berkeley's English department. Mark Twain appeals to academics and non-academics to a degree that you can't find matched in any other writer. He grew up with the country, he represents the Midwest, the Far West, even the New England establishment. He went from being a rough frontier humorist to being the darling of uh, genteel culture, which of course he made fun of. Robert Pack Browning, another of the project editors, is convinced Twain is worth special treatment as an American writer and personality. Using materials from Berkeley's collection, he has put together an exciting display of Twain's life and work at the university's Black Hawk Museum. The language that you and I speak, with its peculiar American qualities, was put down on paper by this man. Notice his handwriting. It's, it's really At the museum, visitors immerse themselves in the issues Twain wrote about, from racial equality to love. A passionate love letter to his future wife is here for everybody to read. I love, 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 love you, and multiplied by 150. And so loving you, I note your faults and knight them with my love. What do you think that Mark Twain uh, feels about this wonderful woman? He was really in love with her. Yeah. <laughs> Twain spent a lot of time on the lecture circuit to gain fame and money. His lecture notes from 1896 help explain the crucial passage in Huck Finn, published 12 years earlier, where Huck is debating whether to turn in Jim as a runaway slave. Huck is prepared to turn Jim in, yet he finally concludes that he cannot do that. Uh, his heart wins out and his conscience suffers a defeat. This was the most popular uh, component of his lecture on this, this grand tour of the world. So good morning. I'm so happy to see all of you. So glad to have be able to welcome you to the Library of Congress this morning and to the ninth annual Jonah Skolk Solkoff Eskin Memorial Lecture. It's not really a lecture though. Today's gonna to be more of a presentation and a conversation and we're delighted to have all of you. We're also delighted to have our author, Philip Stead, with us. And before we get started with the rest of our program, I've got a couple of remarks for you. Um, I'm Leanne Potter. I direct educational outreach here at the Library of Congress. And along with my colleagues in educational outreach and our Young Reader Center, we want to welcome you. And we also want to shout out to you, because we know who all of you are. Um, 
Before I, before I do the roll call of the various schools that are in the room, though, I want to mention that this week is Children's Book Week. Uh, it is the longest running national literacy uh, program or initiative in the, United, in the United States. It's sponsored by the Children's Book Council, as well as Every Child a Reader. And along with schools and libraries around the country, this week is dedicated to celebrating the joy of reading. So we're happy that you're with us today to help us celebrate the joy of reading. All of you, before you leave, will be receiving a copy of this year's um, Book Week uh, poster. So make sure you get those on your way out. They were illustrated by Jillian Tamaki um, and given to us by the Children's Book Council. So nice thank you to the Children's Book Council. Um, also, um, I want to make another shout out and a thank you to my colleagues, to Karen Jaffe, to Sasha Dowdy, to Monica Valentine, the rest of Educational Outreach, as well as our multimedia team for making this morning possible. Thanks, you guys. So we have sixth, seventh, and eighth graders here with us from School Without Walls at Francis Stevens. We have sixth graders from Washington Global Public Charter School. We also have sixth and seventh graders from Stuart Hobson Middle School. We have sixth graders from St. Patrick's Episcopal School. We also have students from Northern Virginia, including students in grades three through six from the River Farm Cooperative School in Alexandria. And, and I, I guess I should say this a little louder, we also have seventh and eighth graders from the Mark Twain Middle School in Alexandria. Um, we're also live streaming this program. And we, ha we know that we've got schools and individuals in various parts of the United States watching. So if you guys want to turn around and wave to them, so they know we're glad that they are tuning in. Um, <laughs> And I really, I need to do a, we have, um, we have some interns in our Young Readers Center who did some homework last week to find as many middle schools in the United States that are named for Mark Twain as they could. And they sent out special notes to those schools telling them about this event. So hopefully we've got some other Mark Twain schools tuning in. Um, I'm excited about that. So thank you all for coming. Um, Oh, and by the way, that because we're live streaming the program, there will be a recording available. So if you really get into the program today, you can watch it again later and you can show your friends and family, okay? You'll all do that, right? Yeah, because the Library of Congress has a YouTube channel and I know you all follow it. And we're on Facebook. Um, so today's program is about Mark Twain, but it's just sort of about Mark Twain. Um, how many of you, raise your hands if you think you know a thing or two about Mark Twain? Okay, all right, some good hands going up. So as you learned from the video that we showed you, Mark Twain was a writer, he was a lecturer, he was a humorist, he was also a publisher. And we're going to learn a little bit more about him today, but we're also going to focus not just on Mark Twain, but really we're going to focus on the work of this guy and his wife. So Philip Stead is with us today, and he's got an incredible story to tell you about Mark Twain that's very closely connected to the papers of Mark Twain that you got a glimpse of in the video. And with all of our programs here at the Library of Congress, we like to make sure that, that we understand what the connection to the library and its collections might be with whatever topic we're focused on. So we did a little digging, and not only are there Mark Twain papers in the Bancroft Library out in California, but there are some terrific Mark Twain materials here in the Library of Congress. One of them's up on the screen. Um, in 1874, Mark Twain, who, of course, his real name was Samuel Clemens, he wrote a letter to the Librarian of Congress, and he did so because he had written a series of sketches, and he wanted to ensure that his work was being copyrighted. You can go ahead and hit that next slide. Um, so he's writing to, this is in May of 1874, and he's writing to the then Librarian of Congress 
um, Ainsworth Spofford. He says, Dear Sir, I enclose a design of a pamphlet cover upon which I desire copyright. Also, the title page of the pamphlet, upon the contents of which I likewise desire copyright. Fees, $1, enclosed. Very truly yours, Samuel Clemens. Um, so we, I have to say, we love it when we come across things like this in the library's collection. So a handwritten letter from Mark Twain related to copywriting some of his work. But not only does the Library of Congress hold original letters, but the library also has an enormous collection of newspapers uh, and magazines, and many, 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 literally millions of them are available through the library's um, Chronicling America website. And the next slide shows you um, one of those political cartoons in one of those magazines, Harper's Weekly, um, that shows Mark Twain as well. And I know that in your textbooks and other materials, sometimes, go ahead and click it again, you often see things like the uh, the political cartoon, but you miss it the context. You sort of miss that it originally appeared in a newspaper, and that's the fun part about looking at original sources, as you see where they originally came from. Um, I want to say one more thing about the video that we watched. Um, we were so excited about this. A couple of years ago, the library entered into a partnership with WGBH-TV Boston. It's a public TV station. And because of that partnership, the American Archive of Public Broadcasting was established. And through the American Archive of Public Broadcasting website, you can access literally thousands of public television programs like the one we watched. So when we started digging around the website and came across that entire film, I mean, it's a lot longer than what we saw, related to Mark Twain, we were pretty excited. So another shout out to the fact that the library's collections come in a huge variety of media, from motion picture films to newspapers and periodicals to manuscripts. Library collections are so much fun. They're not just books. But if they were books, and you happen to go on the library's website, and you happen to do a search on Mark Twain in the main card catalog, guess how many times you'd find Mark Twain's name? Not millions, but about 3,000. There are about 3,000 books in the library's collection that are either written by Mark Twain or about Mark Twain. That's a lot. 3,000, that's incredible. And they're not just in English either. Lots of, lots of those materials are in languages other than English. Okay, so enough about the Library of Congress and its collection. Um, but what I love most about all of those materials, and the reason we wanted to highlight them, is to really emphasize to you that the materials that are in the library often speak to us, they inspire us. They are the ideas and the thoughts and often the voices of not only people who are living today, but people who lived in the past. And our speaker today certainly has a story in that vein to tell us. Um, so I'm gonna do my official introduction of Philip now. Um, so here we go. It is my great pleasure to introduce our very patient and award-winning author, Philip Stead, who, with his illustrator wife, Erin Stead, wrote the exceptional and unique book, The Purloining of Prince Olio Margarine. <laughs> Philip also wrote Sick Day for Amos McGee, which was the 2011 Caldecott award-winning illustrated book by his wife and him, Bear has a story to tell, Lenny and Lucy, hello, my name is Ruby, Jonathan in the Big Blue Boat, and A Home for Bird. I suspect some of those titles are familiar. <clears throat> now here's the opportunity you've been waiting for. How did Philip Stead find the unfinished draft from Mark Twain, and what did it take to complete and become a published work? All right. Uh, well, thanks for having me, everybody. Uh, this is kind of a treat for me. I very rarely get to speak to uh, middle schoolers or high schoolers. Uh, I normally, I'm talking to very young children or I'm talking to adults. Uh, and so I flew in last night from Michigan and I had a few hours that were free. And so I had dinner uh, with somebody I hadn't seen since I was in high school. Uh, I went to middle school with this person too and I was talking to her and she said, she was the valedictorian of our school, by the way. Uh, we were talking about what I was going to be presenting today, and she was asking me a lot of questions, and then she said, you should tell them about how you used to skip school all the time. 
And I said, I absolutely should not tell them that. <laughs> uh, and so I'm on record not telling you that right now. <laughs> I absolutely never skipped middle school or high school. Uh, so I'm an author. I'm also an illustrator. Um, I've either written or illustrated about 15 different books with about five or six more to come in the near future. Uh, these three books are the three books that I made with my wife, Erin. Uh, Erin uh, could not be here today, but she was the artist on all three of these books, and she's also the artist uh, for this Mark Twain collaboration that I'm going to be talking about today. Uh, a little bit about myself before I begin. Uh, I'm from the state of Michigan. Has anybody here ever been to the state of Michigan? Oh, that's not too bad. Mm -hmm. uh, I love Michigan. One of the reasons I love Michigan is because there's so much water. Uh, I grew up uh, down here uh, near Detroit, so people from Michigan like to show their hand when they're talking about where they're from, because uh, Michigan is shaped like a mitten. So Detroit is down here, and now I live way up there. Do you guys see that red dot up there? So I live way up there, and then do you see an island sort of right above that, a big island? Okay, so remember that island. We're going to come back to that in a minute. I think it's important to, to know where a person or where, where an author is from, because I think something about where you're from um, will inevitably sort of creep into the types of things you make. I think that's absolutely true of Mark Twain, who, uh, as you heard in the video, was from all over, but really, I believe he's from... Hannibal, Missouri. That's where he was born. He was born along the, the Mississippi River. And I think there's something about being from that place that has infected everything he's written. When you, when you live along the river, I imagine that you're always seeing people coming and going, and there's constant motion and things coming into town and out of town. And when I read Mark Twain's work, that's what sticks out to me. There's, a, there's always a coming and a going in his, in his books and in his stories. They're always uh, traveling stories. Uh, I think the water is important to me, too. Michigan is surrounded by water. And uh, this is right, this is maybe five minutes from where I live. People think of Michigan, and maybe they imagine something that looks more like Ohio, like flat farmland. But when I think of Michigan, uh, I think of beaches, and I think of big, open expanses of water. And when I want to be, um, uh, when I want to be quiet, and I want to think about my thoughts, I want to think about my writing, I go to the water, and I, I sit in quiet places near the water. Uh, I live in an old farmhouse, and beside the old farmhouse is a big red barn. Uh, my wife, Erin, and I have turned the red barn into an art studio. Uh, so this is the inside of the studio. And the upstairs, when you walk upstairs, uh, it's just a library. It's all books. So when we don't have any ideas, we just go upstairs and we, we sit near other people's ideas. Uh, and then once we've got an idea, we go back downstairs and we sit at our desks and we begin to draw. Does anybody here... Uh, does anybody here consider themselves an artist? Yeah. So I think I was 10 years old. I think I was 10 years old when I, when I was given my first drafting table. A drafting table is one of those tables that sort of lifts up like this so you can draw closer to your face. And I think it's really important as an artist or an author, either one, to have a space that you work. Um, and it doesn't have to be as big and, and and, and open as this barn. It can be a corner in a room. It can be in your closet. I remember when I was very little, I used to go in my closet and lock the door, and that's where I would work on my projects. But it's important to be alone with yourself sometimes. So that brings us to Mark Twain and the story, uh, the story of how this story came to be. So in the year 1879, uh, Mark Twain was in a hotel room in Paris, and he was telling a story to his own children. Uh, this is something that he would do almost every night, and we know that because he would write about these moments in his diaries and in his journals. And the way it would normally work is one of his daughters would bring a magazine or a newspaper. They would open up to a page, and they would point at an image. And from that image, Mark Twain, it was Mark Twain's job to come up with a story for his daughters. And sometimes it was successful, sometimes it was not so successful. Uh, but we never really had any actual evidence, written evidence, of any of these stories uh, that survive to the present day. So fast forward all the way to the year 2011. There's a man named uh, Dr. John Bird. He was a professor in, uh, from North Carolina. And he was out at that archive that we just saw in the video uh, in Berkeley, California. And he was doing research for a Mark Twain cookbook. He wanted to write a cookbook based on food and recipes that could be found in Mark Twain's writings. 
So we had the researchers pulling out any file folder that had anything at all to do with food. So there was one folder, and it was just labeled oleomargarine, <clears throat> which today we would call margarine, which is something you can find at the grocery store that is kind of like butter. Uh, we always had margarine in, in the refrigerator when I was a kid. Uh, so when they open up this folder, instead of finding anything about food, what they found were 16 pages of handwritten notes for this children's story that Mark Twain had told his daughters in Paris that night. Uh, this was enormous news in the Mark Twain universe, uh, because it's not every day that you find something brand new from the most famous and important American writer who has ever lived. Interestingly enough, though, at some point in the 100 plus years between the, the original telling and when it was discovered, somebody had actually pulled it out of the archive thought that maybe it was a little bit illegible, people wouldn't be able to read it, and decided to type the entire thing up on a typewriter and just stick it right back in the folder and forget about it. So this thing had actually been discovered before, but the person who discovered it the first time didn't realize the importance. So this is actually what was given to me. Uh, it was not a completed story, it was notes for a story. And, and I was asked to please uh, find a way to complete Mark Twain's original idea. So this is a a daunting task, but right away I began making notes on that original, um, on this original document. Sometimes I agreed with what Mark Twain, the ways in which Mark Twain was telling the story. Sometimes, uh, almost immediately in fact, I found ways to take issue with what Mark Twain uh, was doing with his story. For example, Mark Twain had, uh, right on this very first page, a main character in his story named Susie, which is also the name of his daughter, and that character was a kangaroo. I felt that this was a mistake that he had made. <laughs> Mark Twain loved kangaroos, which you can actually, uh, you can learn a lot about Mark Twain, and that's one thing that comes up again and again. Mark Twain loved kangaroos. But as a storyteller uh, that works specifically in children's literature like I do, um, I know something about kangaroos that he doesn't, which is that if you put a kangaroo in your story, you just made your story in a very specific place, in a very specific country. What country is that? Australia. Exactly. So every kid everywhere knows that kangaroos are from Australia. And I really didn't think that Mark Twain wanted to set this, this book in Australia. Uh, so I crossed off kangaroo, and I made that character into a skunk, which has made some Mark Twain <laughs> professors very angry with me. Uh, so what I got was four and a half pages of notes. And at the end of this last page, uh, the story just ends. There's, there's no official ending, ending to the story. There's just the point at which he stopped taking notes. And there was never um, a clear answer as to whether the final pages of the manuscript were missing, or if Mark Twain never got around to writing them, or uh, maybe there never was an ending. I'm of the opinion that there actually never was an ending to this story, because this is a story that Mark Twain was telling out loud um, probably over the course of several nights. And so there didn't, didn't really need to be an ending. It was the kind of story that just continues to um, have new material uh, every, every night when he would sit down with his children. But that doesn't really work if you're trying to make a book. A book needs to have an ending. So you can see my own handwriting at the end. That was the very first thing I, I wrote uh, for this project, where uh, I get to the ending and I just write, then what? And that was my, that was my task, figuring out then what. Uh, so for me, that meant going very far away. And very far away for me meant uh, an island in the middle of Lake Michigan. So you remember that island that uh, was just north of where I live? That's called Beaver Island. And I had never been to Beaver Island, uh, which is not unusual because very few people have ever been to Beaver Island. This is what it looks like uh, from the airplane that, that I had to take uh, as I was leaving the island. There's very few buildings. It doesn't look anything like Washington, D.C. There is a tiny, tiny town at the very far end, um, and then that's it. There's about three buildings and a lighthouse. There's only one road that cuts down the middle of the island. So I originally arrived on, that, on a boat. I had my bicycle. I rode all the way to a cabin that was owned by a friend of mine. The cabin had no phone. It had no internet. It had no television. It had no radio. And I had decided that I was going to stay at this cabin until I had written something. Uh, it's always, the hardest part of any project, I think, is beginning. And I can, uh, I can put off working on something forever if I don't get 
to it right away. So that's why I ended up on this island. As I'm riding my bike around the island, though, I kept encountering these, these signs along the side of the road. Uh, and the signs were all talking about this man named James Jesse Strang, who I had never heard of. And I knew nothing about the history of Beaver Island before I arrived there with my bicycle. Uh, this is where the story, I mean, the, the story of Beaver Island is strange, but it's also where the story of the making of this book becomes very strange. Uh, in the 1850s, the Mormon church was led by a man named Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith died, and then there were several people that were sort of vying for control of who would be in charge of the Mormon church. So there was a man named Brigham Young who took a bunch of his followers out to the state of Utah, and that's why so many uh, followers of the Mormon church still live in Utah today. But then there was also this man named James Jesse Strang who took his followers to Beaver Island. When he arrived at Beaver Island, he decided that he had had a revelation from God, and that revelation was that he should be named King, King of Beaver Island. Uh, this was very funny to me, that there was a King of Beaver Island that I had never heard of. Uh, I learned shortly thereafter, you know, I'm riding my bike down the road, I end up at a different sign, and it says, this is the, the, the spot where James Jesse Strang issued a particularly unpopular proclamation, and then he got himself killed. So this, again, was very funny to me. And it seemed like exactly the kind of story that Mark Twain himself would have been really interested in hearing. Because Mark Twain uh, was always interested in how American history, American politics, American religion all kind of mixed together to make one um, sort of uncomfortable story. So I didn't know what to do with all this information. It seemed important to me. Um, it seemed important because it was something that I thought Mark Twain would be interested in. It also seemed important to me because it was a story about a king and a kingdom. And here I was working on a fairy tale uh, that was about a king and a kingdom. And so I couldn't figure out exactly how, but I knew that I wanted these two things to go together. And I was worried that, um, that I was already sort of going off in a wrong direction and Mark Twain maybe wouldn't be so happy with me. Uh, but then, my very last day on the island, I pull a book off of the shelf. So again, I'm at a library. It's a much smaller library, but it's a library just inside this little cabin. Pull a book off the shelf, and a page falls out. The book was a, um, a little paperback of stories and essays by Mark Twain. And this quote was on the page that fell out. It says, narrative should flow as flows the brook down through the hills and the leafy woodlands. Its course changed by every boulder it comes across and by every grass-clad, gravelly spur that projects into its path. Its surface unbroken, but its course not stayed by rocks and gravel in the bottom in the shoal places. A brook that never goes straight for a minute, but goes and goes briskly, sometimes ungrammatically, and sometimes fetching a horseshoe three-quarters of a mile around, and at the end of the circuit flowing within a yard of the path it traversed an hour before but always going and always following at least one law. Always loyal to that law, the law of narrative which has no law. And I love that last sentence, the law of narrative which has no law. And I really felt like that was Mark Twain giving me permission to tell this story in any way that was necessary. Um, and I really felt that that was the way that Mark Twain would want me to tell this story. But then began, after I come back from the island, I get something down on paper. It's really not a finished story yet, but at least I've got something. I really felt like I needed to, to do more research, to really understand who Mark Twain was. So there were uh, sort of two ways to approach how, how to write this story. One would be to try to predict every single word that Mark Twain would have said. And right away, I felt like that was um, a recipe for failure. There was no way to really know, over 100 years later, what Mark Twain would have said. But what I could do is get to know who Mark Twain was as best I could. And if I could know who Mark Twain was, then I might be able to tell a story that, uh, that he would be happy with, that he would be proud of, that would honor the spirit of Mark Twain instead of trying to be um, literal about the way that he would have told the story. One of our first stops that my wife and I took uh, was to this house. So this was Mark Twain's house uh, in Connecticut. This is where he lived when he wrote many of the, the, his most famous works. It's the, the house that his children grew up in. 
It's a big, beautiful, elaborate house. It's so big, I really couldn't even fit it all into a picture, so I'm just showing you one little piece of it. Uh, this is Mark Twain's personal writing room. This was my favorite place in the house. Uh, it's got his billiard table. Uh, that, that desk in the back is where he would sit and do his writing. What I really loved about this house is that even though it's, uh, today it's a museum, and even though it's a big, beautiful, elaborate house, it really still felt like a home. So when you walk into it, you really feel that this is a place uh, where a family that loved each other lived. You can imagine the stories being told. It didn't at all feel like a museum. Another piece of research that was really important to me, there are actually two more pieces that I want to talk about. One is the autobiography of Mark Twain, which was published in three volumes. And when you stack them up together, it's about this tall. What was so important about the autobiography of Mark Twain uh, is that he had stipulated he didn't want it published until 100 years after his death. Uh, the reason being is that he had put all of his grievances into that autobiography, all the things that he was feeling irritable about, all the things that were bothering him, maybe about, there was a whole section about copyright at the Library of Congress <laughs> that he was upset about. Um, and he was, he was able to uh, put information down in a very honest way that he may have felt inhibited, more inhibited if it was something for publication while he was still alive. Uh, in addition to that, he didn't actually write the biography. What he did is he spoke it. He tried and failed several times in his life to, to work on his autobiography. And towards the end of his life, he realized that the best way for him to go about it was not to uh, start with the day of his birth and just write down every single instance along the way until his eventual death. What he wanted to do was just wake up in the morning and before he even got out of bed, just start speaking about whatever it was that was on his mind. And somebody else in the room would be writing it down. This was hugely important for me because the story I was writing began as what we would call a piece of oral history. So it was a story that was spoken out loud in real time between Mark Twain and his daughters. And here I had pages and pages and pages of Mark Twain oral history. And I think we all know that the, the way that you speak out loud is different from the way that you write on paper. And there might be some, some overlap between the two, but I really needed to get to know the Mark Twain that spoke aloud, and that's a much harder Mark Twain to find. The other piece of research that was really important for me was a biography written by Mark Twain by his 12-year-old daughter, Susie. Uh, this was probably the most important uh, piece of, of, most important original document that I came across. Here we have um, a quote from that biography. So she's 12 years old and she writes about her father. He couldn't bear to hear anyone talk but himself, but he could listen to himself talk for hours without getting tired. So I could find no other instance of anybody writing critically about Mark Twain. Anybody that was willing to acknowledge what kind of flaws did this person have. Um, although Susie thought her father was very funny, she thought he was very brave, she thought he was very intelligent, she also had critiques of her father. And I wanted to know those critiques. Uh, Mark Twain would also be writing down notes in his own journals and diaries about Susie. So here's one that says, Apparently, Susie was born with humane feelings for the animals and compassion for their troubles. That was one of my favorite quotes that I came across because that's when I recognized that if this was a story that Mark Twain was telling to his own children and to Susie in particular, who I think was his favorite daughter, <laughs> and Susie was a child who had a lot of love and compassion for animals, then love and compassion for animals should be a part of this story, even if it's not a part of the original notes. Uh, here's another quote from Susie, uh, and this quote is actually at the very beginning of the book when you open up the book. It says, I have wanted Papa to write a book that would reveal something of his kind, sympathetic nature. Uh, this, you know, as I'm talking right now, I think that this was actually probably the most important single piece of information that Aaron and I stumbled across. Uh, because Mark Twain you have to imagine, he's not just a famous author, he's the most famous and important person on the entire planet when he was alive. He's uh, less like a famous author, more like, say, Kanye West. So he was the, the Kanye West of his day. 
<laughs> uh, because of that, I think it was very difficult for Mark Twain to be honest when he was in public. He felt a real burden to always be funny. I think he felt a real burden to always be very smart. He wanted to be the smartest and funniest man in the room. But he had a hard time revealing that part of himself that was kind and that part of himself that was vulnerable. And I really thought that those parts of himself would be the kinds of, would be the parts of himself that would be revealed if he was telling a, a story just to his own family. So this is what my writing looks like. And I kind of cringe at the idea that my own notes will end up someday uh, you know, at the Berkeley Archive or the Library of Congress because my notes look a lot like my own middle school homework. Um, <laughs> this is the very first passage from the book. So it's a note written by me um, that sort of explains how I'm going to tell the story. And the way I imagined myself telling this story was that uh, I imagined Mark Twain was there with me and he was telling me the story and now Mark Twain is gone and it's my... It's my job now to tell it back to you. And I'm going to tell it in my own way, but I'm going to be as faithful as possible to the man that told, told it to me in the first place. Uh, so now I'd like to talk to you a little bit about how the artwork was made. Uh, so Erin would normally do this part of the presentation. She's at home with our 10-month-old our baby right now, so I'm going to do my best telling her half of the story. For Erin, the most important part of the process was coming up with the main character. She really felt that there was no way she could proceed with this project until she knew exactly what this character looked like, exactly how this character moved. Um, in, in this case, she really wanted the character to have two, uh, two things that are very difficult to put into the same person. She wanted the character to look uh, vulnerable and compassionate. She also wanted that character to look brave. And these two things, they're not necessarily opposites, but they're difficult things to put into the same face. And so Erin spent nearly three months working on just this single drawing. She would draw it, she would draw it again, and eventually she came across, or she came to this image of our main character, Johnny, that she was happy with. One thing that Erin does to, um, to find a character is that she'll actually sculpt the character with clay. Uh, for Aaron, that's easier sometimes than, than just trying to draw onto an empty white page. Uh, she, she can just get her thumbs in there, start moving around. What does the nose look like? What does the eye look like? Um, what does the character look like when you turn it? Does it look good from all angles? And once she's got uh, a clay head, this is about three inches tall maybe in real life. And once she's got that finished, what she can do is uh, move it around and draw from it. That way you're not always having to use just your imagination. Uh, Aaron uses all old-fashioned and traditional materials, which is one of the reasons I think we were asked to work on this project. Uh, Mark Twain, when Mark Twain was alive and writing, uh, the most common form of book illustration was probably woodblock printing. Uh, in its day, it would have been in almost every book that you would see that would have images. These days, it's much less common, but it's the way that that Erin uh, continues to work. So on the right side here, we have her carving knives that she uses for carving wood blocks. And on the left are just her pencils that she uses to finish the images. So these are Erin's uh, uh, paints and her brayers and what's called a baron. The little circular object is called a baron. Uh, the way Erin works is she'll carve a wood block. She'll add ink or paint to that wood block using one of those brayers, it's kind of like a paint roller. Then she'll press a piece of paper onto that wood block and then take that circular baron and with the pressure of her own hand, uh, will press the ink from the wood block onto the paper. In the center there is Aaron's color chart. So there are, let's see, one, two, three, 15 colors there. That's every color that Aaron is going to use in the book. Before Aaron makes a single image, what she does is decides the color palette for the entire book. So this is one of Aaron's wood blocks. This is the wood block, one of the wood blocks that was used to make uh, the cover image. So she carved that big, big shape um, that's sort of all smeared in red right now. That's the dragon. And then underneath the dragon's head is the lion. 
After she's added the ink and then pressed the paper, she pulls the paper up, it looks something like this. And then the final step is several hours with her, just with her pencil box where she starts filling in all the details. So this is the image, this is the cover image for the purloining of Prince Oleomargarine. Uh, Aaron also uses the wood blocks in a non-traditional way. So typically he would always be carving away things, but one thing that Aaron likes to do is to add ink directly onto the block and to sort of wipe it softly away just with a paper towel. And by doing that, she can get an image that looks kind of like this with these soft uh, edges for the ground and these soft edges for the clouds, which then became an image that looks like this. So one of the challenges that Aaron was facing was, what is the setting for this book? It was told originally in 1879. We're illustrating it uh, at this time in 2014, 2015, 2016. But it's a fairy tale at the same time, and fairy tales aren't usually set, uh, well, in Australia for one. They're also not set in the United States typically. We kind of felt that Mark Twain would want a buck trend, <laughs> and he would want this book set in the United States. And so what we decided to do was bridge the gap between uh, Mark Twain's era and our own era and to set the book in what's known as the Dust Bowl. So the middle of the country in the 1930s, basically. Uh, it's a really desolate, dusty place, and we thought it was perfect for the kind of story that Mark Twain would tell. So if you, you guys see the, the house up there in the upper right corner, Throughout the book, Aaron dropped in little things that were, um, she would call them Easter eggs, things for people that really love Mark Twain to find so that they could engage with the book in a special way. So that house was actually based on the house that Mark Twain uh, was born in, which is seen here. The queen in the story, uh, who doesn't show up until later on in the story, is actually based on Mark Twain's wife which some people have noticed. Uh, there was one final piece of the, the, the creation of the artwork that really was giving us trouble for a long time. Uh, there were certain, certain elements that we really wanted to be carved in wood and printed, but they were just either, they were too intricate to carve by hand or it would just take us too long. So what we, what we ended up doing was using a laser to carve the wood, which is, uh, involves a lot of me standing and watching this machine work. <laughs> so this is what I'm looking at there. All of the chapter titles in the book, so it says chapter two regarding parades, uh, chapter one uh, in which we are introduced to our luckless hero. All of these chapter titles were carved into wood uh, using this, this laser machine. There are also these, these long proclamations, the proclamations, the unpopular proclamations of the king uh, that would have taken us literally months to carve by hand uh, that we were able to carve in, in maybe 45 minutes using this machine. These are some of my favorite pieces of artwork in the book. This is what that King's Proclamation looks, looks like in the final book. This is what one of the chapter titles looks like. Maybe my favorite individual carving in this book is actually on the end papers. Could I see yeah. the book here? So an end paper is the part of the book, the very first thing when you open the book and the very last thing you see when you close the book. And in most books, this will just be a solid color or maybe it'll just be plain white. But Aaron and I love to do something special for the end papers whenever we can. So we wanted to bring the whole project back to where it began. We wanted people to be able to see a little bit of what Mark Twain's actual writing looked like. So we took that, we took some original pages of Mark Twain's work, we had them digitized, then we were able to feed those into the laser carver, and Mark Twain's actual writing started to get uh, spit out by this laser carver directly into the wood. Uh, and then this is an image of Aaron pulling a print from Mark Twain's handwriting. So these are some of my favorite pieces of artwork. Uh, so that brings us to the conclusion. One of the questions that I get more than any when I'm talking about this book is which part of the book was Mark Twain's and which part of the book is yours? And the obvious answer, the most obvious answer is that the ending is mine. The last few pages of the book are completely mine. Um, but in truth, that doesn't really tell you the story because all throughout the text, he and I are sort of 
uh, interweaving, and sometimes it's him speaking, and sometimes it's me speaking, and I worked very diff I worked very hard, and it was very difficult for me to try to find a way to balance our two voices. My favorite example of something that's neither Mark Twain nor myself, but is also both, uh, is this chicken. So the chicken is my favorite character in the entire book. And the chicken's name is Pestilence and Famine. So as I was doing my research on Mark Twain, one of the things I discovered is that Mark Twain always had cats in his house. Uh, just cats and cats everywhere. When he lived on the farm in Elmira, New York, there were cats in and out of the house and in his writing studio. And the cats always had strange names. Uh, one of those cats was named Pestilence and Famine. Or, and we could never really figure this out, there were two cats, one that was named Pestilence and one that was named <laughs> Famine. The reason we couldn't figure it out is because nobody had bothered to put a comma where you would need to put a comma. And we could never find a satisfactory answer to whether or not there were two cats or one cat. But Aaron and I thought it was funnier if there was only one cat and the cat had two names. So that's why this chicken was introduced into the story uh, as Pestilence and Famine, one chicken that has two names. And that's my favorite example of something that's both uh, a little bit of Twain and a little bit of me and a little bit of Aaron too. Awesome. And um, an example of, of the kind of thinking that we uh, we're using as we were making this project. It's great. I love this story. Isn't that a great story? I'm really glad that you made a point of mentioning how you start the book. I want to read you guys something real quick. He says at the very beginning, it's the note from one of the authors. And he showed you his handwriting version of this, but the part that I really get a kick out of is, most likely you don't know me and you've never heard my name, said too fast or otherwise. Chances are, though, you've heard of my friend, Mark Twain. He's the one who told me this story. I love that. I have a feeling you guys have some questions for him. Um, I love this notion that, that something that he's just shared with you, either about his work or the story itself, probably has spoken to you and you've got some questions. So we've got four microphones all around our room. And when you raise your hand and one of my colleagues identifies you, if you would take the microphone and say your name, and then ask your question. That would be great. Why don't we start right here? Hi, I'm Jaden, and I wanted to ask, what do you, <coughs> uh, would, what do you inspire to be most like, like Mark Twain? <laughs> like um, well, if I could grow a mustache like Mark Twain, I think that'd be pretty great. <laughs> I think uh, there. So I learned a lot about Mark Twain. And as I was working on this, and one thing that I really admire is that Mark Twain was really well known for being able to stand up in front of people, and he would just sort of stand and wait for everybody to get really quiet. And then he would just start talking, and he could tell a story like that. And that really is impressive to me, because it took me three years to write this story, and I think Mark Twain could have done it in about 15 minutes. <laughs> so that's what I aspire to be. I aspire to be somebody who can just get up, tell a story and have it be perfect on the first try. Good answer. Oh, I want to mention as well, for those of you who are watching our live stream, if you want to ask a question, you can through Twitter if you use the hashtag TwainLOC. So if, you, if you're on Twitter and you want to ask a question, if you, if you, go to, if you just use the hashtag TwainLOC, um, my colleague Sasha has her phone ready and she can, she can be on the lookout for any of those questions. Okay, how about we go, do we have a question back there or not? No question? No question? Great. Hi, my name is Eleanor and I was wondering what the like, connection between all the characters was and how they were all connected question is, how are all the characters connected? So this is a difficult one to answer because uh, Mark Twain sort of had his own way in his notes of connecting the characters, but then I had my own ideas for how characters 
ought to be connected, but there are certain characters that were the same throughout. So the character of Johnny, uh, we were very faithful to the way that, that Mark Twain wrote about that character. Uh, also the character of the Queen, who I think was, um, we based it on, on Mark Twain's wife, who he loved very much, but I think that even if he wasn't quite thinking that, that was a character that he was um, particularly in love with. Um, but the, there were so many different options. One, one of the things I love about this story is that there were so many pieces of information that were missing. And that's what was really exciting as a storyteller, is that because there were so many pieces missing, it allowed us to, to make the connections and to put things together in a way that felt appropriate to us. Okay. Hi, my name is Cooper, and what made you like um, Mark Twain so much? So that's an interesting question because I, there were times when I would say that I didn't like Mark Twain very much. Um, we spent so much time working with him as if he were a real live person that we started to feel that Mark Twain was almost like a family member. So you love your family, but sometimes you just really can't stand your family either. And the more that we read about Mark Twain and the more we had to spend time with him, there were times when we just felt like um, maybe it'd be better, Mark, if you would just leave and we could work on this thing <laughs> by ourselves for a little while. But he never left, and now I feel like Mark Twain is permanently living in, in my spare bedroom. <laughs> uh, my name is Zoe Rydell. I was wondering, what's your 10-month-old baby's name? Uh, my 10-month-old baby's name is Adelaide, which uh, is actually a city in Australia. So that Australia has come back into the conversation. <laughs> That's awesome. All right. Uh, my name is Ty, and I had a question about when you went into the house, did you uh, feel like a flashback or anything that you felt inside that could have put you could have put in your books? Uh, do you mean like in the in Mark Twain's house? Yes. So, a little bit. The funny thing is, when you walk into that house, it really does feel like there are ghosts in that house. And it's not a house that I would want to be hanging around in after dark. I'll say that. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Uh, hello, my name is Avery. And was the title of your book um, Mark Twain's title, or did you make that title? Uh, that's a very good question. So Mark Twain didn't leave a title. All he wrote was the word oleomargarine on the top. And so it was our job also to come up with the title. Um, purloining was my editor's favorite word. Well, she has two favorite words. One is purloining, which means, um, if you don't know what this wor word means, it kind of means, uh, it's something like stealing, <laughs> kind of like kidnapping in this case. Um, her other favorite word is defenestration, which means to throw yourself out a window. <laughs> but I, I worked tirelessly to try to get the second word into the book and never was able to do it. <laughs> That's okay. Sasha. Hi, my name is Destiny, and my question was, um, do, is it like a spiritual connection with Mark Twain, or is he still alive? So Mark Twain died in, I think it was the year 1910. Yep. But for me, he is very much still alive. So I guess, yeah, you would call it kind of a spiritual connection. That's cool. All right. My name's Suleiman, and my question was, if those aren't all the characters, then how did you pick which characters to put on the cover? Uh, so that was up to my wife Erin to decide, and all of the important characters in the book are there. So the characters that have either speaking roles or play some, some other sort of important role, and there are a lot of animals in the book that are sort of... Uh, I guess you'd call them background in the story. And so it was, Aaron was trying very hard to put the most, all the most important characters, which would include the, the chicken, the skunk, the lion. On top of the tiger, there is the weasel. The weasel is very important to the telling of the story. And then of course the dragon, which was so big that she couldn't even fit him on the front cover, so he goes all the way onto the back cover too. Uh, my name is Austin, and I was wondering how many drafts did you have to do? Uh, another very good question, how many drafts? So my very first draft was the, the version of the book that I wrote when I was at the cabin on Beaver Island. But I didn't stop writing the entire time we were working on the book. 
So I began writing in September of 2014, and we finished the book in January of 2017. So uh, around two and a half years of writing and rewriting and rewriting. And the way that I work, I don't start at the beginning of a draft and work all the way to the end. I just have the entire thing in front of me and I change a little bit here and I change a little bit there and then I go back to the middle and I change a little bit here. So I can't really tell you exactly how many drafts, but what I can tell you is that I was constantly working and constantly changing. My name's Wesley, and I was wondering if Mark Twain had an influence on any of your other books. Uh, I love that question. So, did Mark Twain have an influence on any of my other books? I think he didn't necessarily have a direct influence on my books, but I do think he had an influence on the type of writer that I became. Uh, people have a lot of different ways to describe Mark Twain, but one of the ways that people like to describe him is as a satirist. So a satirist is somebody who um, finds a way to, to use comedy to better inform people about some serious issue that's going on. And that's always been a really interesting way for me to communicate, something that uh, has influenced me even though maybe there's not a specific book of Mark Twain's that I would look to for inspiration. Hi, my name is Shakela, and I was wondering um, where did you find the, um, the notes for the book, to write the book? So the notes, do you remember the video we watched at the beginning? That was the Mark Twain Papers, which is its own little archive and library in Berkeley, California. So at the time that they made that video, which I'm guessing was about 20 years ago, they said that there were, I think he said 10,000 letters to and from Mark Twain. Today it's all the way up to uh, over 30,000. And they're still finding every single week um, as many as three new letters written to either Mark Twain or from Mark Twain or from a family member of Mark Twain's. And so this archive, it's, it's really a living thing where things are constantly coming in and new things are being discovered. And there's got to be any number of, of little pieces of, of gold stuck in this archive for waiting to be discovered by people. Um, my name is Amani, and I was wondering, why do you think that you were chosen to rewrite this book? Uh, I've asked myself that, too, and I don't, I don't have an answer that I can say is definitely the true answer, but what I think, the, what I think is the reason that we were chosen is actually the abilities of my wife, Erin. So I really think that it's her ability as an artist and the... The, the methods I was showing you, how she works in woodblock, she works with all these traditional materials. I think that Aaron was really um, the bridge between Mark Twain's era and my own. And I just kind of came along because I was attached to her. That's what I tell people anyway. Awesome. We've got time for one more question, and we'll take this one. Hello. So my name is Zozan, and uh, I got a question. So before you wrote the book, did you know uh, what was in Mark Twain's mind. Like, you don't know what, how, the way it was, like, the book was ended. Like, how, what was in his mind? Did you, like, figure out this? So, or you, like, took t your time? So it was, the most difficult part of this job was figuring out what was actually inside the mind of this writer. And instead of trying to figure out what was in his mind on that very specific day, what I tried to, to figure out was what was on his mind throughout his lifetime. And if I could figure out what was on his mind throughout his lifetime, then I would have a better chance of, of figuring out the ways that he would have told the story. Um, also, before I leave, I want to make sure that somebody gets me one of these t-shirts that just says Twain on it. Because um, I, I don't have any, anything quite like that. So if, uh, yeah, that'd be great. Awesome. Um, Thank you all so much. Your questions were terrific. And Philip, thank you. Thank you. I also want to, I also want to give a very, very special, I want to give a very special thank you to Dr. and Mrs. Eskin, who are here with us, who made this program possible. Thank you.
as I mentioned at the beginning of this program, Dr. and Mrs. Eskin um, are responsible for the Jonah Skolkoff Memorial um, Program here at the library. And they've been supporting this for nine years. And every one of these programs, I just think, are marvelous. I think your connection to this story, your way of telling it, um, and having it be about inspiration and discovery is very much a part of, a part of, of why you are here. And so thank you, and thank you. Um, and thank you to those of you watching on the live stream. We love it when our audience gets extended. So thanks to all of you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.